Welcome, friends. This is A Course in Miracles, Palm Beach Study Group. We are in uh, the text, uh, Chapter 8, Section 6, The Treasure of God. In the book, it's on page 148. We are the joint will of the sonship whose wholeness is for all. We begin the journey back by setting out together and gather in our brothers as we continue together. Every gain and our strength is offered for all. So they too can lay aside their weaknesses and add their strength to us. God's welcome waits for us all, and he will welcome us as I am welcoming you. Forget not the kingdom of God for anything the world has to offer. Well, that's, that's very nice of Jesus to let us know that that we're walking on the journey together and that each as each one of us becomes aware of this journey, that we add our strength to the whole. And, and in thus doing so, we help everybody else who's uh, following along with us. And uh, for the last sentence, forget not the kingdom of God, for anything the world has to offer is the same as saying, forget not the kingdom of God for anything the ego has to offer. Paragraph two, the world can add nothing to the power and the glory of God and his holy sons, but it can blind the sons to the father if they behold it. You cannot behold the world and know God. Only one is true. I am come to tell you that the choice of which is true is not yours to make. If it were, you would have destroyed yourself. Yet God did not will the destruction of his creations having created them for eternity. His will has saved you, not from yourself, but from your illusion of yourself. He has saved you for yourself. So to, re, to repurpose that paragraph, to, to reword it, the ego, can add nothing to the power and the glory of God and his holy sons. But the ego can blind us to our father if we behold it. In other words, latch on to it. You, we cannot behold the world and know God. Only one is true. And we have no choice in the matter. Spirit is the only truth. Ego is illusion. If, if it were up to us and we chose ego, we'd be destroying ourselves because ego's ultimate goal is to kill us. But God did not will the creation of his creations of us. And he has created us for eternity. And so God's will has saved us not from ourselves, but from the illusion of ourselves, which is the ego. And then it says, he saved you for yourself, your true self, your spiritual self. Are there any comments or questions up to this point? Okay, then paragraph three. Let us glorify him whom the world denies. For over his kingdom, the world has no power. 
no one created by God can find joy in anything except the eternal, not because he is deprived of anything else, but because nothing else is worthy of him. What God and his sons create is eternal, and in this and this only is their joy. Paragraph four, listen to the story of the prodigal son and learn what God's treasure is and yours. The son of a loving father left his home and thought he had squandered everything for nothing of value. Although he had not understood its worthlessness at the time, he was ashamed to return to his father because he thought he had hurt him. Yet when he came home, the father welcomed him with joy because the son himself was his father's treasure. He wanted nothing else. And so we are all the prodigal son wandering through the ego world trying to seek happiness and looking for love in all the wrong places. Uh, but when we decide with our own free will to return to the Father, to return to our spiritual selves, we are assured that the Father will welcome us back with open arms because he knows that we, we were just kids out there trying to uh, uh, to make it on our own and realize that that wasn't the way. Any questions, comments? Paragraph five. God wants his son, uh, God wants only his son, because his son is his only treasure. You want your creations as he wants his. Your creations are your gift to the Holy Trinity, created in gratitude for your creation. They do not leave you any more than you left your creator but they extend your creation as God extended himself to you. Can the creations of God himself take joy in what is not real? And what is real except the creations of God and those that are created like his? Your creations love you as much as you love your father for the gift of creation. There is no other gift that is eternal, and therefore there is no other gift that is true. How then can you accept anything else or give anything else and expect joy in return? And what else, what joy would you want? You made neither yourself nor your function. You made only the decision to be unworthy of both. Yet you cannot make yourself unworthy because you are the treasure of God and what he values is valuable. There can be no question of its worth because its value lies in God sharing himself with it and establishing its value forever. So we are, we are God's only treasure. And we are also creators. And what we create in love, we, we give back to the Holy Trinity. As we, as God extended himself, we can extend ourselves. Um, 
let's see. And, and then it says in paragraph 10, I mean, uh, sentence 10, and what else but joy would you want? Good question. You made neither yourself nor your function. We are the children of God. He made us and our function. But the only decision we could, that we made was to be unworthy of both. In other words, by deciding for the ego. But even that's not true because we can't make ourselves unworthy because we are the treasure of God. And so no matter how unworthy we may think of ourselves, that's all just part of the ego illusion. The truth of the matter is that we are the sons of God. So the book is trying to teach us just, you know, embrace that, embrace that knowledge and, and that, and accept that, that you are the child of God. Embrace that. Jill has her hand up. Go ahead, Jill. What I was going to say is two sides of a coin. The ego is either self-aggrandizing or self-deprecating. It's the same coin, the one that says, oh, I'm unworthy, or the one that says, oh, I'm so fabulous, I'm so amazing, you know, whatever. It's two sides of a coin. And um, that's all. Oh, thank you. Okay, then. Um, any other question? Uh, any other? There we go. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I have one. Yes, David. Uh, I'm always tripping, tripping over joy. Ah. Oh. What do you mean by that? Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, maybe I can't always feel joy and I'm, um, I don't really understand what joy is. And I see some people, they look joyful. And I look at myself and I don't always feel joyful. And um, I, look, I look for that, you know, where, I heard somebody this week say, uh, when they're at peace, they're joyful. But I'm at peace, but I'm not always joyful. Any explanation? Well, yeah. Um, I'm going to say that um, we're talking about joyfulness and terms of spiritual joy but again with with our our words uh, you can define joy uh, from the ego's point of view too lots of people are very happy and joyful when they get a lot of money when when they're in you know uh in ego activities that, that make them happy and what have you. But, but the kind of joy we're talking about is a very sublime, peaceful joy of spirit. And so um, you don't necessarily have to feel the jumping up and down, oh, I'm so happy, joyful, that that's associated with a lot of the ego stuff when you are serenely, peacefully, in, joyful in meditation. So, you know, you, you, you really have to define your words and understand that what, what's, what, what, why you're, you're talking about it. I don't know. Does that make any sense to you? No. <laughs> oh, okay, then. <laughs> oh, now I feel joyful. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I made you laugh. All righty, let's see. Melanie, you also have your hand up. 
Yes. Hi, guys. Um, so I, um, I also can relate to what you just said, David, in terms of like conditional joy, um, you know, and, and how the external influences, you know, I, I have these experiences of joy that the egoic joy, I would, I'm, I'm committed to getting to a place where I'm emanating joy from inside of me outward versus looking for joy outside of me and um, comparing my joy with somebody else's potentially like I I think it's really valuable to um, know that not everybody just you know when I see people experiencing joy I in turn like my uh, interpretation of that is that it's a reflection back to me of what I have inside of me. And so, David, I want to invite you to maybe consider that, that this is kind of just a mirror, not just, but it's a mirror back to you of who you are. And, um, and the, the fact that you're seeing it and witnessing it. Um, the other part is, is that, you know, the, the, I, another thing I've been looking at is just comparing, is about comparing myself to other people and knowing, like, I don't, I don't, I, I want to stop doing that. Um, because I believe that everybody is, you know, we're all having our own ex human experiences. And, you know, people are going to have their emotions dynamically as they, you know, as they're, they're experiencing them, um, including obviously myself. And uh, yeah, so I just I wanted to share that because that's something that I've been really focusing on you know, as of late in terms of wanting to have a more consistent experience of myself in my own skin. And I think that by focusing inward and not looking outside of myself for the gratification has been very supportive lately. Thank you, Melanie. And yeah, I, I, I'm going to continue with this because I'm I'm reflecting upon what I said too and I didn't mean to imply that that all emotional joy is ego joy because I'm I'm thinking no you know that's that's not true um, we're in the ego world but we're supposed to be, I hate to say suppose, but it's, it's good if we're being or living our ego life in a spiritual way. That's like what we're trying to do here. So, so if you're if you're living with love and you're living with joy and you're living with peace in the ego world, that's that's the way um, we want to be, as opposed to living with anger, living with uh, 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 fear and and all the, the negative emotions. So. If, if we're playing with our children and that makes us joyful, well, that's great. I would consider that, you know, a spiritual joy. If you're able to, to help somebody and that brings you joy, I would consider that a spiritual joy, you know, um, as opposed to uh, somebody who feels joyful when they beat somebody up because you know that's that's not spirit beating somebody up is not a spiritual activity so you know so again we have to be discerning and and the, and the problem is that we don't have two words if we had two words if we had one word that indicated spiritual joy we had another word that indicated ego joy it it would be different but we're using the same word here in, in different contexts. So that's a lot where the confusion comes from is just linguistically. Uh, Jill, do you care to add to this conversation? Yeah. Um, so thank you all. Um, and 
What I would say, David, from my own personal experience is that joy is for me related to two things. And that is knowing God, the more that I know God, the more joyful I am, the more that I understand the life of Jesus in particular, the more joyful that I am. And that's what his promise is for all of us. That is the promise. That is why it's called the gospel. The gospel means the good news. And so knowing the gospel, knowing what Jesus taught is a formula for joy, number one. And for myself, I'm just saying for me personally. And number two is service. And so I would say service renders joy. So that's, that's my own personal experience. And um, that's all. Thank you, Joe. Let's go on to uh, paragraph six. Your function is to add to God's treasure by creating yours. His will to you is his will for you. He would not withhold creation from you because his joy is in it. You cannot find joy except as God does. His joy lay in creating you, and he extends his fatherhood to you so that you can extend yourself as he did. You do not understand this because you do not understand him. No one who does not accept his function can understand what it is. And no one can accept his function unless he knows what he is. Creation is the will of God. His will created you to create. Your will was not created separate from his. And so you must will as he wills. My first comment is that the will of God is always good. The will of God is for there to be peace and joy and love. And all and all good things. And I think that we can go back and we can qualify our words uh, here um, to help clear up some of the um, uh, the dysfunction made by the language. So when it says, uh, in paragraph three, his joy is in it. So if it's his joy, it's spiritual joy. And you cannot find joy, I'm gonna say you cannot find the joy of spirit, except as God does. And his joy, again, spiritual joy, lay in creating you, and he extends his fatherhood to you. And so that's, the children are like the father, and so that's what we do. And it ends up by saying that our will is his will. And just to be mindful of the fact that his will is always good, is always for the good. Let's go to paragraph seven. An unwilling will does not mean anything, being a contradiction in terms that actually means nothing. When you think you are unwilling to will with God, you are not thinking. God's will is thought. It cannot be contradicted by thought. God does not contradict himself. And his sons, who are like him, cannot contradict themselves or him. Yet their thought is so powerful that they can even imprison the mind of God's son 
if they so choose. This choice does not make the son's function unknown to him, but never, I'm sorry, this choice does make the son's function unknown to him, but never to his creator. And because it is not unknown to his creator, it is forever knowable to him. So basically that's just saying, you know, we have been created with free will. We free will, through our free will, we chose to create the ego world and to imprison our minds into the ego mind, but that did not negate God's will for us. And that did not negate how God sees us and how God thinks of us and how God knows us because he created us, he is knowable to us forever. And it's just a matter of us releasing ourselves from our own imprisonment in the ego mind. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Apparently, David has to leave us, so we'll catch him next time. Um, paragraph eight. There is no question but one you should ever ask of yourself. Do I want to know my father's will for me? He will not hide it. He has revealed it to me because I asked it of him and learned of what he had already given. Our function is to work together because apart from each other, we cannot function at all. The whole power of God's son lies in all of us but not in any of us alone. God would not have us be alone because he does not will to be alone. That is why he created his son and gave him the power to create with him. Our creations are as holy as we are and we are the sons of God himself as holy as he is. Through our creations, we extend our love and thus increase the joy of the Holy Trinity. You do not understand this because you who are God's own treasure do not regard yourself as valuable. Given this belief, you cannot understand anything. And when we hear such words as these, that you do not understand this, the, the, that, is, that is a you that's referring to uh, the you who is steeped in the ego mind. Uh, many of us on this journey are learning to understand. And as we increase our understanding, a sentence like this, you do not understand this, becomes less and less viable to us. Because yes, we are on this journey. We are studying the course. We are learning to understand. So don't take this also personally. And uh, if, if, if the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Paragraph nine. I share with God the knowledge of the value he puts upon you. 
my devotion to you is of him being born of my knowledge of myself and him we cannot be separated whom god has joined cannot be separated and god has joined all his sons with himself can you be separated from your life and your being the journey to god is merely the reawakening of the knowledge of where you are always and what you are forever it is a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed truth can only be experienced it cannot be described and it cannot be explained i can make you aware of the conditions of truth but the experience is of god together we can meet its conditions but truth will dawn upon you of itself Sentence six, the journey to God is merely the reawakening of the knowledge of where you are always, which is heaven, and what you are forever, which is the child of God. Truth will dawn upon you of itself. And our last paragraph 10. What God has willed for you is yours. He has given his will to his treasure, whose treasure it is. Your heart lies where your treasure is, as his does. You who are beloved of God are wholly blessed. Learn this of me and free the holy will of all those who are as blessed as you are. And thus ends our reading for tonight. So the floor is open to your comments and questions. Nothing, nobody. Well, if that's the case, let's have a moment of silence and we'll stop our recording for this evening. <laughs> 